Okay, welcome back to part two of our discussion of the GLHE Pro inputs related to the borehole design or borehole completion. And we have a little bit of mix of, you know, what are we entering in GLHE Pro and a little bit of discussion of the modeling. Okay, so um, the last uh, part we talked about the specifying the geometry and the borehole diameter. Um, now we're going to, sort of looking down elsewhere. You'll see there's a, a dialog box to choose whether you want grout, uh, a grout filled borehole or groundwater filled borehole. And if you choose groundwater, then you have to choose whether it's constrained by heating or cooling. So in North America, almost all boreholes either are or should be backfilled with grout. Okay, some are backfilled with cuttings, uh, which is, is not a recommended procedure. Um, but by most should be backfilled with grout. In Scandinavia, mainly, and here I mainly mean Sweden, Norway, and Finland, uh, although there's places in the US and Canada that have similar geologies, so this solution could be used. Um, where there's hard rock, they use uh, groundwater filled boreholes. And then they usually put in a um, steel casing from the bedrock to the ground surface and they have something they call a well top which is a, a cap on the very top so in some respects there that borehole design looks more like a water well sealed at the top but with you know with a uh, u-tubes drop down into it the u-tubes just literally hang there in that case okay so glhe pro can handle either situation um, the convection correlations that we need for the uh, groundwater filled boreholes, those go, uh, were developed maybe about four or five years ago from when, from April of 2020, some, somewhere in that region, maybe four years ago, I think. Okay, so you'll choose one or the other. All right, the grouted boreholes, the resistance the is this is a if you look at the actual geometry right it's quite complex since you have these non coaxial tubes uh, inside a round borehole so it's a it's a rather complex conduction problem um, we use a method developed by Johan Clausen a professor at University of Lund and his students and the original method is developed in the 1980s uh, was the you can compute with a computer program any what's known as an order of a multipole so we use a tenth order multipole which is say numerically very accurate um, of course in practice your ability to control the pipe spacing and so on means that the the uh, extreme accuracy you know, may not we may not be able to take advantage of all of it, but it serves very nicely as a reference tool. But more recently, Professor Clausen and one of his former graduate students, Saqib Javid, uh, developed some close, newer, simpler closed form expressions that work quite well. Um, and the, they're developed in these two papers here. And then Saqib Javid and I wrote a book chapter. Um, it was published in 2016. And then in 2017, we sort of finalized the accuracy of, of I think, 10 different expressions or something like that for single YouTube uh, cases. What you find is that the, or what we found was that these simpler closed form expressions, say the first order multipole, that's really quite good. Um, sometimes people say they use the multipole method and they're using a zeroth order, which is not very, isn't great accuracy. The first order is actually pretty good. Um, so if you're a researcher and are interested or developing your own tool, I would look at these uh, closed form expressions. But when we were developing GLHU Pro originally in the mid 1990s, um, this was, you know, this was the best thing available. Okay, and I would, if you're a researcher or just anyone really wanting to understand understand accuracy and some of these arcane matters 
such as why ground thermal properties, out, what's outside the borehole actually affects the borehole thermal resistance, and I'd recommend, well, particularly this last paper. Right, and I, there's this little excerpt from the paper where it shows the pipe wall temperature around the pipe and the borehole wall temperature around the borehole. Right, and actually as conductivity gets higher in the ground, this will smooth out and that it actually has an effect on the borehole resistance and even more so the grout um, resistance is affected by the grout conductivity um, well for multiple reasons but one thing that the um, well let's see maybe i should put this another way as the the grout thermal resistance, yes, it heavily impacts the total borehole resistance, but also the convection coefficient and the pipe co thermal conductivity, they affect the overall borehole resistance in a way maybe that's unexpected. And it, so, I mean, if, for example, we used a copper tube, right, we would, s this is the temperature difference going around the tube. Of course, that would smooth out very nicely, right, and that would decrease the borehole thermal resistance. So. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, just to use GLHE Pro, you really don't need to know that, but if you're interested in the details, that's where you, that's where you would find them. Okay, groundwater fill boreholes. Uh, here it's kind of interesting. The resistance depends a lot on the, the buoyancy driven flow in the, in the borehole. So you can have a situation where near, near 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees C, yeah, 39 Fahrenheit. The derivative of density with respect to temperature goes to zero. And that means we can have relatively little, um, relatively low convection coefficients. So we can actually get some variation uh, depending on the situation. So to model this uh, before GLHU Pro 5, your only possibility was say to modify the grout properties to, to give you an equivalent to a groundwater filled borehole. Um, if you measure the borehole resistance with a thermal response test, then you would say have a target that you were looking to, to, to reach. Um, although if the thermal response test was injecting heat and your design condition was heating where you're extracting heat, uh, that might not be a great idea. But in any case, that's why it's important to get the correct design conditions and that's why GLHE Pro asks about if you use a groundwater fill borehole, whether it's heating constrained or cooling constrained. So the convection correlations are published in a paper um, in applied energy. And uh, well, this is just a drawing of the, the flow of the, the heat transfer network. This is some results for some boreholes in Norway. Um, and what we have here on this axis, we have the experimental borehole thermal resistance. So it's going from about 0.07 degrees Kelvin per watt per meter up to about 0.11. And then on the vertical axis, this is our, our prediction of this with two different short circuiting conditions. And so you can see we match pretty well. You know, it's not perfect. And there's a, some complications in real life um, that limit the, you know, the ability to predict this, specifically if there's lots of cracks in the a borehole wall and water is flowing outside of the borehole. Uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard, very hard to account for that uh, when you're designing a ground heat exchanger. Okay, so if we're especially when we're back to uh, grouted boreholes, it's mostly a matter of getting the geometry and the thermal properties correct. Right, so we need to get these conductivities correct, and you might notice that we have these volumetric heat capacities which strictly speaking aren't needed for computing the resistance, although the, um, the fluid uh, inside the borehole, that's volumetric specific heat is, is used, but that's provided separately. So, but, oh, and the, so the reason for that is because we're also calculating in the same, time we're calculating the short time step g function so we are calculating the transient behavior and the method we're using is described in this paper by Shu and Spittler.
Okay, um, convection coefficient, that's computed by the program, or if you'd like, you can check entered value and put in your uh, value. You put in a fixed value. Um, it depends, of course, on the properties, right? And this is one reason why when you specify the fluid, you specify the, this average temperature at the peak condition, so that's what it uses. Um, if you're in the midst of a design, right, and you're trying to design the ground heat exchanger, and you're in the midst of changing the number of boreholes, uh, you need to recalculate the borehole thermal resistance each time you change the number of boreholes because the flow per borehole is going to change. And so then the convective convection coefficient changes. Uh, short circuiting, I've addressed this at an introductory level in the ground heat exchangers introduction to modeling part two. Right, but we have both of Hellstrom's expressions implemented. You can choose either one or just choose the mean value. Um, as I mentioned there, in most cases in a typical North American borehole that's maybe, say, 250 feet or 80 meters deep, um, it's unlikely to make the short circuit is unlikely to make much difference. But as you go deeper, boreholes, um, especially uh, the way they design relatively deep boreholes in Scandinavia these days, the actual short circuiting is likely to become more important. Okay, so I'd like to close. I just have a few general comments on the whole borehole design. All right, so it is true that decreasing the borehole thermal resistance will generally decrease the required size of the ground heat exchanger. Uh, so ways to do this, uh, you, you can use thermally enhanced grout by putting quartz sand or carbon particles in the grout. You can move the pipes closer to the borehole wall. Uh, you can use a smaller borehole diameter, which usually has the effect of moving the pipes closer to the borehole wall. Uh, you can use thermally enhanced pipe. That's commercially available. Uh, thermally enhanced fluids, a possibility. There's uh, certainly some research going on with um, adding nanoparticles to fluid that would, say, increase the convection coefficient, decrease the convective resistance. Uh, I'll just say those are possible measures. Uh, well, you could also increase the flow rate. That will decrease the resistance, although it costs you more in pumping power. So not necessarily recommended. Okay, how much decrease can you get? Well, there's no, there's no one number. It depends. It depends a lot on the ground, the, the ground thermal conductivity. So I've heard, you know, people make claims of saving 40% and so on. And, you know, it, it, I'm, well, I can't say for sure if that's even possible, but it may be that if it is possible, it may only be possible where you have extremely high ground thermal conductivity, right? So you have to have some sort of, uh, I guess, either intuition or you can actually do this, at, you know, you can calculate it in GLHE Pro, but, you know, in general, you're, you're going to need higher ground thermal conductivity to get um, the best effect of uh, some uh, decreased borehole thermal resistance. At the same time, the ability to implement these measures often involves a, a trade-off right? um, between installation time and the cost, sometimes also you know, the materials cost, but uh, often the installation time and then the cost to install it, and the trade-off between that and the thermal performance. So this is, it's kind of an interesting subject for me because there, there are many schemes that people have come up with um, that they'll promote that, you know, will, I mean, in a sense, they'll actually work in terms of they're actually going to reduce the borehole thermal resistance compared to, say, a standard YouTube with uh, standard bentonite grout. But unfortunately, they're not economically feasible. And by that, I mean, in many cases, uh, you know, the standard solution, if you can drill and put in boreholes fast, it's cheaper to add a few more boreholes than it is to, say, put in spacers. Uh, that's not always the case, but I'll just say it's often the case, especially in this part of the country, um, where one of your challenges is to keep the borehole open long enough to get your tube down, uh, your YouTube down.
Okay, so there are some schemes, things like double U-tubes with spacers. They're more feasible when there's hard rock, right? So it's easier uh, to keep the hole open and uh, that's not so problematic. When you have limited ground surface area, so if, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to say just drill more boreholes, but if you don't have room for them, you don't have room for them. Um, sometimes when drilling is more expensive, uh, especially if the rock will stay open, all right, then it may be that somebody can drill the borehole and somebody else can come along and put in the U-tubes um, and spacers. So, you know, it may work out in some cases, but it's, it's, it's more likely to be, there's more likely to be certain situations that drive it like limited ground surface area. You've got an urban situation, you have a very small area where you can actually drill. And there are some schemes that historically we found difficult to install. So there was one that was called the spider. Right? And it was something like one center tube with eight small diameter tubes. It was just very hard to get down, get it down in the hole. Right, and then of course fusing it up at the top is going to be difficult and so on. So, but you know, probably if you could get it in, it probably did have low thermal resistance. I, I don't, I don't have any firsthand experience with with that measuring it. But okay, and lastly but not leastly, don't forget the purpose of the grout is to protect the groundwater from the infiltration of surface pollutants. So we don't want a system, or we don't want things that will. Uh, um, limit the ability of the grout to protect the groundwater. So if, for example, you had a complex, complex geometry that you couldn't actually get the grout pumped in properly, uh, it might not be a great idea, no matter how good the thermal performance is. Okay, so we'll stop there.